My name is Greg Walker. I'm an engineer at Glue in San Francisco. And today we are talking about scalability in our game, Diner Dash Adventures. Um, what that means, how we built it into our development, and probably some cool tools along the way. So a little background, what, what is Diner Dash Adventures? It's a mobile game, it's a time management game. You're, you're a server in a hotel or a diner, You've got lots of customers with orders and desires, and they come in, and you have to make stuff or find stuff and deliver it to them. Everything takes a little bit of time. There's lots of stuff going on in the world, and you're just trying to manage everything as efficiently as possible. Um, none of that's relevant to today. Uh, we are talking about the metagame world. So we have this isometric world that sits on top of that core gameplay, and it's the town of Diner Town. And lots of things are going around in Diner Town. Uh, not as much dining as you might think, but it's where our kind of quest story happens, where the metagame is going on. Lots of things to connect the, the core gameplay sessions. There's, there's buildings, there's characters, animals, lots of animations, lots of stuff to just fill it with life. Um, functionally, it serves as our level select. It's where you pick what, you know, what level you're playing next. Um, it's also the basis for the metagame story, and it's a, it's a key place for the player to customize by decorating and changing what everything looks like, and you can, you can really personalize the whole world. So where does scalability come into this? Um, we are a continuous content game. We're always releasing new content over time after we're live on a very regular basis. Uh, we know the world is going to grow as the story gets bigger and longer. So in this context, scalability is our ability to add content as we need it. We've been live for about a year, and the world has already tripled in size. Um, it's just going to keep going. The, the first picture up there is where we shipped a year ago. The second picture is where we are now, which is a whole lot bigger. And who knows where we're going to end up. Um, a year from now. So more explicitly, if we were going to make some goals about this, we want to be able to add world content or assets. Um, we want to be able to add metagame features into the game. And this sounds, this sounds pretty normal for a game. Like, why, why are we worrying about this? Why not just make it handle all of this right from the start? And time. Like, everything takes time to develop developing a game engine on top of this, even on top of Unity, is a big task. And we're always limited for engineering resources. So the metagame, this, this world, is not the main focus of the game. It's not the core gameplay. So we need to be smart about how we're developing it and try to be as efficient as possible. So kind of the key, key idea here is that it's what the user experiences. So the user doesn't really care how the game is working internally, right? We, we love to nerd out about that sort of stuff, but as long as the end result is okay and is what we want them to see, the, the end user, the player, doesn't care what's going on under the hood. So at the start of the game's life cycle, we can actually get that end result for the user with the very minimal impl implementation because this metagame world that we started with is fairly small. It hasn't gotten big yet. And as the world grows, we can grow the implementation as we need it. And it's, it's far more efficient in terms of engineering time. So the less time we're doing at the start you know, for this, the more time there is to just work on other features. So from the implementation, where, where exactly did we start? We just had a single Unity scene. All the structure and components were built right into the hierarchy. All the assets linked right into their components, just normal Unity stuff. There was no fancy loaders or anything. This was really easy to edit, easy to see in the editor all at once. Um, we didn't have a big asset cost at release. The world wasn't very large or very complicated. So this easily fit into executable and runtime memory limits and all the budgets and stuff. And it worked. We shipped with it. Um, the main good thing about this was it was something we could grow from without backtracking. And this is a, this is a really important point. 
the initial scene layout that we shipped with was fairly different than where we are today. But at no point did we scrap it all and start over or change around everything. We, we just used the initial, initial layout that we shipped with and evolved it into where we are today. So why didn't we just stop with what we had? You know, what, what were the problems with where we started? And this first one, everything's packaged into the executable. So this is not okay. We're a mobile game. Both platforms that we're shipping on, iOS and Android, they both have executable size limits for cell downloads, and we want to be under those. So because everything's packaged in, executable size is tied right to the total content size. So that's, that's not a good thing. Similarly, the world size here, runtime memory size is tied to our total content size. So that's, that's also bad. And any asset referenced directly by a component in the scene gets directly loaded at scene load time. So everything is always loaded, and we have no control over what's in memory. This last one's a little more subtle, but how much do you really need to know about parts of the world, this big, huge scrolling map that isn't currently visible? Right? Everything has a little bit of overhead. And just from a performance standpoint, the easiest way to optimize is just to have less stuff. So more specifically, the world at the start was we had a single tile map layer and then sprites on top of that, a bunch of sprite renders, spine animations, flash animations, some FX. The sprite layer and all the animations and stuff, uh, the sorting was handled all automatically by Y value top to bottom, just isometric style. Um, if you don't know about it, in graphics settings, you can set a custom transparency sort mode. And that, you define an axis, and it'll sort all the sprites by their position in the world by whatever axis you define, in our case, screen top to bottom. And that gives the, the fake depth that we want for isometric. As we're organizing things into the hierarchy and building the world, we're building everything into chapters that correspond to the story because, in general, this also corresponds to a localized area in the world. Each story chapter, it, it all kind of happens in one place. So at this point, it's mostly for work for, workflow reasons to kind of split up the world and avoid prefab merge changes because a couple of people are working on this and it, it gets ugly. But we're also looking forward towards the future when we could evolve this concept into more streaming. Um, so that worked, and again, we shipped with it. And as the world started to grow, then we went and started fixing up some of the limitations we had. So Avi's first target was to get this runtime memory under control. And there's two parts to this. We want to get control over what we're loading and when. And this means no direct asset references, no you know, sprite, render, dot sprite, because those are automatically loaded all the time at scene load. But at the same time, we don't want to break the ability to see everything in the editor so we can still work on the world and actually edit it. And I'm not going to really go into too much detail about this. Most of it has to do with our specific asset loading system, our, our bundle loader. Um, we're still using an older version of Unity 2017, so addressables aren't an option. Uh, they weren't around when we were developing it, but you should just use addressables. Uh, they solve all these problems. Um, so we clear out the, sprite, the dot sprite asset reference and store it in a separate component in the same place on the same object as a bundle name and an asset name string pair. It looks a little something like this. Uh, this component gets added to everything that has a sprite render and stores the text asset references along with some code to load and unload that asset from the bundle and assign it into sprite render dot sprite. Uh, we have very similar nodes for spine animations and flash animations and really anything that's in the world that has a heavy data payload that we want to control when the data is loaded or not. Um, so what does this accomplish for us? This gives us control over when asset loading happens. So it's not all on scene load now, and we can choose when to load them. Initially, this is triggered in on enable, so it's loaded every time the active object comes into the hierarchy. But because of some of, the, some of the ways that we do player customization inside that scene, there's actually quite a few disabled 
game objects sitting around. So already, just being able to control this on, uh, on enable for the active objects is a big savings over what we had before. For the second part here, we, we want to not destroy the ability to actually see the world in the editor while we're building it. And this means we need those sprite render asset references still in place. So to bridge that, we need a data convergence step. And we get that through something called iProcess scene. And it's an interface the editor gives you as a callback to each scene in the build right before runtime. So for device builds, this happens during the build process. And for editor builds, it happens actually at runtime, uh, right at scene load. And you can modify the scene and do whatever you need uh, to it. So we find all those sprite renders in the scene, add the new streaming node component that I just showed, and then switch over the asset references to clean it all up. And this is an automatic step. So from a production standpoint, this is really good because we haven't changed any of the world data that we've already built. We've just added some tool steps on top of what's already there. So now that we have control over when stuff gets loaded, how can we use that even better? And if we know where each of these nodes is in the world, then we can change the loading code to only load them when they're close to being on screen. So as part of that pre-process step, we can also compute and store the visible bounds of each node and store it inside that streaming node we just made along with the asset ref. And for sprites, this bound is obvious. Um, for animations, we run through all possible frames of the animations. You make sure you get the whole thing. And same for particle effects. You sim it for a while and just make sure you're getting the complete bounding box. And now that each node knows where it is in the world, we can make a manager that keeps an eye on the camera bounds and loads and unloads all of the relevant uh, visible nodes. So if you look at the bottom scene view here, the node bounds are outlined in green and the camera bounds in red. And you'll notice if you can see the camera bounds has a couple different recs there. The innermost smallest one is actually the camera viewport. You can kind of see the UI moving around with it. While the other two are the loading and unloading bounds. And they're bigger than the camera to give a little bit of buffer loading room there when you're scrolling around fast. We don't want to load it in right at the edge of the camera. And the, the two are different among themselves because we don't want to load and unload at the same place in case the camera is just flickering a little bit. We, we, we want stuff to stay in, even if, you know, even if the camera's a, a little bit moving. So as an interesting side note here, we're actually using synchronous loads for the sprites instead of async. And async used less frame time, but that actually wasn't the limit for us. The overall delay between the request and the load return was too long. So we had to push the, that outer load bound, the, the uh, biggest two red rectangles there, out really far. Or otherwise, if you're scrolling around really fast, you'd over, kind of overrun the loaded part of the world, and you start seeing blank spots. So this was bad because the bigger bounds meant we're just loading much, much more of the world than we needed for a, kind of a small edge case. So it, it wasn't worth it. And sync loads are actually fast enough that we could do a few each frame and then manage them and you know, how many we're requesting each frame on our side by just limiting the node activations every frame. And it worked a lot better. Uh, I wouldn't have really thought of that unless we profiled and you know, tried a few things. And in the end, we only do this for sprites, not for the animation data, because that's, that's heavier and still needs to be uh, async. But this is very fairly specific to our use case, definitely not a universal rule. But it's kind of a good point that sometimes you just need to profile and try some new stuff, because this is not something I would have expected. So a little plug for kind of editor extensions here um, in the scene view. I love these. I have tons of them. Um, we got a tool for the streaming, ma streaming manager here that overlays all these recs on the scene view. And here, they're all green because everything's working, because this is a GIF and not a live demo. Um, but if it was live, there would have been errors and it wouldn't be working. And all those green recs show up as different colors depending on load status and a couple other things to show errors and warnings and all the various statuses that could go wrong. And 
dumping logs to a console is one thing, but sometimes this stuff is very visual, and it's a lot easier to debug problems if you can associate an error with an actual specific location in the world where it's occurring. So this is, this is super helpful for that. So where are we now? We took the initial static scene that had everything loaded at the time and turned it into a streaming world. Our runtime texture footprint is pretty much constant now. So note that we haven't yet, we still haven't changed any of the scene data. We added a tool step and a bunch of new code, but we haven't backtracked or reauthored any of the existing content at all. The world creation process is still the same, the old data is still valid, and production, because we're live, you know, new world content just keeps on moving. So what about all this hierarchy data? We, we're only streaming the asset data. There's still a fair amount of hierarchy stuff and just metadata sitting around in the scene hierarchy. So going back to this slide, this was our world built into pieces by story chapter, each one being a separate prefab. So since everything in the prefab is localized by story, it's already in one spot, we can actually take everything we just did to the individual nodes and just apply it to the whole prefab as a big piece. So each area of the map, which we're now calling a chunk, it's built into a prefab, and we've got a manager that stores an index list of all these uh, chunks and their prefab, along with the world bounds, and we can use that to load and unload them according to the camera position. So here's a very similar view to the last one um, that we had with the individual nodes, but this one's for chunks. And the camera bounds are still shown in red down in the, the bottom left there, but now there's an additional two bounds shown. And it's, it's a lot more zoomed out, so those, the three inner ones are the same camera and individual node load and unload bounds that we saw before, but the two new outer ones, there's one kind of tight around the middle and the big red one around the outside, those are for the chunks. And the outer one is much larger than the rest for a couple of reasons. Resource-wise, a chunk is fairly cheap, uh, at least compared to the texture data, so it's not that worrying to have it have more loaded than the camera is really seeing. Um, much of the non-rendering data that we store in the hierarchy is kind of used for like mid-level game state. It's not, it's not important enough to persist permanently, but we don't really want to forget about it as soon as it goes off screen. So stuff like animation states or character locations, it'd be weird if those reset as soon as they got off screen, because if you were just moving around the world, moved off and came back and that the guy was doing something totally different. So having the data loaded at a, at a wider range, it's just a good middle ground and kind of an, an easy way to get session level persistence. But finally, load time for these chunks is actually relatively expensive. Most of the load is done asynchronously for a, a giant prefab, but the final step to integrate all these game objects into the scene has to be done synchronously. So we set the unload bounds really wide so that once a chunk, you know, once we pay the cost of loading that chunk, it stays around for a while. And even with that, you know, that lets us load the chunk infrequently, but we still have to do it at least once. And that prefab itself is still hitching when it loads. So part of that synchronous step that is the problem was enabling all the new objects that we put in there. And we're not even doing that much in awake or on enable or anything. There's not a big cost there, but there's just a lot. It's a big hierarchy. There's a lot going on, so it's enough to matter. And the, the best way we found to mitigate this is to store all the game objects inside that prefab, so the whole chapter prefab, uh, as disabled. And then after the prefab loads, over the next several frames, we enable all those new game objects back to their original state most of them are enabled, some just never get enabled, uh, just in batches over, and we spread that out over a couple of frames. And again, it wasn't a big chunk of time, but it was enough to move that out of the instantiate call, and that, that took care of all the hitches that we were getting. So now that we have world chunks, we can use this opportunity to take the single tile map that we had in the world and break it up into multiple parts. As the world grows into different themed areas, kind of by story, the ground tile sets that we're using 
end up being completely different. So like a grassy park area versus a sandy beach, for example. Um, having this many tiles resulted in the original single tile atlas overflowing into multiple pages, which mostly defeats some of the purpose of having it in an atlas. Um, so now we can split up the world by region with their own atlas, and each re region ends up being one of these uh, chunks. So not only is each atlas down to a single page again, because it's just the grassy park chunk, or it's just the beach chunk, uh, but now it loads and unloads when it's off screen, so that's even more efficient. So there's a downside of unloading all this chunked hierarchy data like this, the, the extra metadata that's not just for rendering. And a lot of the world used to be available all the time, and now it's no longer guaranteed to be there. Uh, for example, maybe there was an object in the world that one of the tutorials wanted to scroll over just to look at. When everything was loaded all the time, it was available and indexed into the system so that we could find it as needed wherever you were. But now it's only loaded if that chunk is loaded because the camera happens to be nearby. So something far away is going to be completely unknown to the system. So to fix this, we just ended up storing a very minimal set of index data along with each chunk. So just enough to know which chunks are relevant to whatever operation we need to do. And it's, it's a constantly adjusting list of stuff depending on just what we need, but very, you know, as small as possible. Uh, and then at runtime, if we need to find something, we can figure out using this little index contents, uh, figure out which chunk we need, force it to load, and then kind of totally separate from the camera logic, get into memory and do what we need. So more tools, I, I love tools here. Uh, to make the chunks even easier to work with, we've got this overlay on the scene view. And this shows over the scene view whenever just the map scene is open. Uh, it expands up and down, so it's not blocking the whole view. But you can use it to load and unload each of these chunks into the edit scene to work on them. And this really makes it easy to focus on just the part of the world that you're, you're working on. Or you can load everything and you know, see it in context. Um, you can also trigger a chunk build from here, which is our new post-processing step that we had to introduce to take over from that I process scene step that we had before. We need this separate now because the chunk streaming, uh, at runtime, we start with an empty scene and load the chunks we need into it instead of having them all there at the start and taking them out. So there's the main scene is actually empty now, so running I process scene on it, there, there's nothing in there to process. Um, so we have to do these kind of as an intermediate build step. But this also runs a bunch of unit test-like validation checks on that chunk data. So if there's any data errors with how we've set up the world or any, you know, any of the logic in the world, uh, we can detect it here at build time. And it's much, much easier to find and fix right away if the chunk just doesn't build. So if you're working on something and you have to, you have to build the chunk to get it into the game, and if you get errors right there, you know, you know, it, it helps. No errors, no errors get very far. So for pathing, uh, our pathing is a very simple A star grid, and the data is independent of the rest of the world. So it means it's not tied to the tile map or any of the world grids or anything like that. And this means we can take pathing data wherever we want. Uh, it doesn't have to cover the whole world. It can just cover where the characters are, and it doesn't have to be at the same resolution as anything, so it doesn't have to match any of the tile maps. In our case, the pathing data is about twice as detailed as our ground tiles. So the overall world isn't a nice, clean rectangle for its outline. Our, our world's just this funny shape, and we don't want to make a single grid that covers everything, a big, giant array, since there'd be lots and lots of wasted data, um, and eventually it would get really big. So we actually built the pathing data in chunks of smaller chunks, like 32 by 32. And they're just added in wherever we need pathing data. And then the pathing algorithm knows how to stitch those together and do, do its pathing on the, the small, smaller chunks. And more tools, because I like tools. All of the, the pathfinding data is hand authored, because for a world like ours, it's it doesn't take very long to do this. 
Uh, so we just do it by hand, and we have tool windows built into the editor that you can add new, new sections, those 32 chunks, and visualize and paint all the pathing weights right on top of the scene view here for all the different layers. Uh, we have pathing for humans, we have a layer for flying stuff, for swimming stuff. Um, and this tool also allows you to test pathfind right in the scene view. The game doesn't even have to be running. So you can move around some, te some test start and end points and see where it will send a path and where one of the characters will go. So if you're playing the game and characters are going weird places or not ending up where you, where you think, you can you know, check it out right away and start tweaking the results and just see, see the results and all possible options right there. So back to the goals. So far, all of this has been about raw data, like the actual assets. And we built it all to be scalable. We started from a static scene, went to a streaming world, um, didn't backtrack on any of the existing world content. But what about the second part here? What do I mean by that? So we want to apply that, first, that same first concept to features. And by features, I mean not, not big game systems in the engine, but smaller player experiences that are just happening around the world. Uh, it's a little bit different than the assets, but kind of the same idea. When we, when we add new stuff, we don't want to break the old stuff. Um, for gameplay, a big part of this is just data isolation. You know, if you, if you can know that the feature you're adding in can't possibly affect anything else, then you don't, you don't really have to worry about it. Um, so this is a perfect use case for a higher level scripting system. And we've got lots of little snippets of things around the world interactive features or non-interactive background stuff that it, it could be C-sharp code, but it doesn't really belong there. It's unique to a certain spot in the world, and it makes a lot more sense if we can author and store it as part of that world data. So we wrote a visual scripting system. Each of the nodes here is a, a fairly high-level action that you link together and branch to get whatever you want. Um, making a new node is pretty easy in code. You just inherit a base class and then override a few things for the functionality. Uh, these scripts are great for everywhere or anywhere that we want to kind of sandbox some high-level logic. We use them for cinematics, for part of the game story, uh, for background vignettes that are just running around the world. They could be triggered by AI characters or player interaction, or sometimes we just have them running in background loops to give a little life to a corner of the world. Um, the main idea is that we want to be able to add custom behaviors or encounters to the world and totally from the data side. So back to our original goal for adding features that adding new ones don't affect any old ones. Uh, these scripts are always running at a higher level than the game code. So changing one script can't affect any of the other scripts, and it's always isolated in our own little sandbox. One of the stronger aspects of the scripting system is that it has something called value bindings in it, so that any script can essentially take arguments, turning it into a function. And this is really powerful as we integrate the system into all the various gameplay systems. We have a container class for it with a custom inspector, so you can build a script handler into a regular normal component, and then any of its custom arguments that you have defined in the script data just get exposed in the inspector. And a good example of using this, uh, we have character interaction points around the world. An AI can go somewhere, do something. Um, it's just a location in the world with a filter system that defines what type of character can use it, and then a script to run when the character actually gets there. And normally the script only needs to know about the character itself, it just acts on that, that single character. But in this case, uh, slightly more complicated case here, uh, we have a pig as the character, but also a treadmill and a windmill in the world. And we want to override these two world objects for whatever they're normally doing and animate all three of them together. So when the pig arrives, the script starts running, the 
pig is automatically bound to a character input value for the script just by the interaction point system. But there's also the two custom input slots that we defined in the script data uh, right when we created the script. And these get automatically exposed in the inspector when we hook that script up to the interaction point and build that into the world. And then we can assign the treadmill and windmill game objects to those slots and they get passed in along with the script. So when the pig arrives, the script starts running, then the script has all three things to play with and it can sync the animations and do whatever we need. It's really a great way to control the world as we need it, but completely from the data side. So takeaways. We, we didn't have all of our tech done right away. Um, we started with a really simple static scene. We shipped with it. And then over time and multiple live releases, uh, we evolved that into a streaming system, but in a way that we had planned for from the start. So we didn't need to go back and change any of the existing world data. Uh, we tried to isolate things both by world position and by release time so that building new content in the world touches as little of the old stuff as possible. And finally, we also isolate one-off features and world encounters into a higher level script system. Uh, it sandboxes them from each other and from the rest of the game and mostly our own bugs and stupidity. So, so that's it. Uh, thanks. Any a couple of mics for questions or come up and grab me or send me an email. But. All right, no questions. Thank you. Oh, question. Hi. Uh, I want to know if you have like seasonal data in, in your game and how you handle it in, with, with these mechanisms that you implemented. Like uh, data that it's only activated uh, for a period of time. Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? If you have uh, like seasonal data in yeah in your game and how you handle it with, with your uh, current uh, way of working? You mean if, if parts of our world are seasonal? Yeah. Uh, so we have a few ways to handle stuff like that. Um, the, the chunk system that I was talking about where we can load individual chunks, those actually aren't, they're not really restricted to a localized area, so you can have a chunk that covers the entire world. So for example, if we want to have a wintertime season, we could just make a chunk that covers the whole map and we put snowmen and snow piles and you know, stuff like that all over the place. And then each chunk we can tag with certain kind of time limits. So that, that whole chunk will only load when it's wintertime. Okay, cool, thanks. Yep. Hey, what's up? Uh, how long did it take you to build the visual script editor? And you know, I'm sure I already know the answer, but do you think it was worth the time investment? Uh, for the last one, yes, definitely. We've gotten tons of use out of it, um, and it's really, really helpful. I want to say the first implementation of it was really quick and dirty. It probably took a week. Um, and most of that was just the, the rendering for the tool that you see in that tool window. Um, that was obviously not where we ended up with today, but it, in terms of just dedicated development time, I think it was about a week. And then since then, as new features come up and new things we need, you know, a, a couple hours here and there. Uh, but it really, for a whole visual scripting system like that, it, it hasn't been that much time. Thanks. Yep. Uh, when you're constantly loading and unloading assets uh, as you stream them in and out, 
do you find that there's a, uh, a garbage problem? Yes. Um, that's, that's not a, there's not really a great solution that I have for that. Like, we, we have to load stuff in and out because we have this huge world and the whole thing doesn't fit in memory. So there's not, there's not a great solution to that. Um, in practice, we're getting away with it. So th there's, no, there's no magic solution that I have for that. You know, we are creating garbage and we're cleaning up garbage and we hit garbage collector hitches. Uh, I did a fair amount of work to basically schedule garbage collections. So if you, you, know, if, if you can do the, the unload unused assets call, that'll usually force a garbage collect. And if you just do nothing, that'll happen willy-nilly whenever you want. But if you call it manually, you can kind of control when that happens. So you don't, want to hap you don't want it to happen when the camera's scrolling around. So if you kind of watch for what the player is doing, there's naturally little half-second, quarter-second gaps in a regular player's gameplay. And if you can sneak a garbage collect in there, they almost become invisible. You're still hitching the game, but no one notices. All right, I think that's it.